Good morning. I'm Maurice Crespi, managing partner of Schindler's Attorneys. Schindler's Attorneys is the co-founder of COBRA. Uh, COBRA stands for COVID uh, Business Rescue Assistance. The idea behind COBRA is that we assist uh, in a whole host of disciplines, companies in distress in, in any which way that we can. Uh, we have a website with a fantastic knowledge base on there that we told is the most comprehensive in the country. Uh, we have experts that will provide advice during private Zoom sessions if, if required. We meet with your staff, um, uh, discuss the position they're in, consult with them and in relation to any arrangements that you may require. And importantly, we assist in rescuing businesses um, in distress. Uh, what we also do is we assist businesses in rationalizing their businesses. So in circumstances where they're not in distress, but uh, steps need to be taken uh, uh, to, to get through this uh, in the most efficient and effective manner possible. What we also do is we provide these webinars uh, as, as part of our knowledge sharing, and uh, hopefully they do assist businesses. In fact, we have no doubt that they do. Um, and today we have uh, one of our most exciting webinars to date. We have Bob Skinstat and Catherine Young, who will be discussing business with a buck using leadership skills to capitalize on the changed world. Um, before I do an introduction and I go into the details, what wasn't given to me in the bio around uh, Bob was the fact that he's also involved in uh, other charities. He's involved in the Atlas Foundation and the Put Foot Foundation, according to the internet. And this is quite important because, you know, we have our tra traditional charities and now uh, we have the likes of Bob uh, assisting the likes of Cobra uh, it's quite remarkable how, how charities have changed and how suddenly there's been a pivot towards assisting businesses. And now we have superstars coming on the show uh, who similarly want to assist uh, you guys and uh, any business that you may be involved in. So over to the buyers, Catherine. Catherine is an African entrepreneur with executive level experience across a number of businesses, including a su successful corporate career holding various senior and executive positions in companies, including Deloitte, Chevron, and SAP. Her capabilities are underpinned by deep engagement and care for people across her work career. As the founder of Think Room, she's involved in the entrepreneurial ecosystem across Africa and the UK, as well as acceleration programs uh, through her co-ownership in Grindstone Accelerator. She is an SME ecosystem influencer in Africa and works with clients in the space of entrepreneurship development across the continent. Catherine holds a BCom with specialization in marketing and national diploma in procurement from the University of South Africa and Nelson Mandela Bay University, respectively. Bob, Bob is a partner at Draper Gain Investments and Knife Capital Venture Capital, a public speaker and sports pundit. He holds key leadership roles, including having captain the South African national rugby team, acting as a chairman or board member to a number of businesses, and he plays a critical role in the funding land landscape globally, globally. He uses his unique combination of learned skills and natural affinity of people to create connections and value for businesses. He holds a Bachelor of Arts and lives in Weybridge, UK, with his wife and four children. I'm going to hand over to you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Before I do, let me introduce my remaining panelists. We have Ember Marseille from IQ Business, Re Renee Klopper, IQ Business, and Gary Barachovitz from Schindler's Attorneys. Over to you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Maurice. Fantastic. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here. Hey, Bob, lovely to see you. Um, it's, uh, it, it definitely is for us. Um, uh, Bob, I don't know if I mentioned to you, this is our fourth one in a series um, uh, with Cobra and it's, it's lovely to end it, uh, the, this series uh, with you coming on. So thank you for that. I think I'm going to share my screen. Thank you for those who've all been uh, dialing in along the way. Uh, it's awesome to just share some of these, um, of these things with you. So really today we're going to be talking with the topic of leadership and um, I truly don't think I'm privileged enough to work with Bob um, in business uh, in in um, in our Grindstone Accelerator, where Knife Capital is um, is the the other part of the of the parenting team of, of Grindstone uh, Think Room, and 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 it's just 
been awesome along the way as we've gone into this journey. Um, and Bob, I know that you're going to be comfortable that we just speak from the heart today because it's going to be a panel like that. Um, and as we've gone into this journey with, uh, with, with Brian Stone and, and, and with Knife, it's been so fascinating how um, people show up. And when we um, gave our topics through to, to the COBRA team to talk about it, this thing of, of leadership and especially leadership in the time of change, I truly couldn't think of anybody else uh, but you, Bob, because if it's, and, uh, and I'll put you on the spot a little bit today, I think, but it's just um, how Bob has just been, I've been watching you uh, from a business point of view on the other side and how you just show up and just get the thing done and think um, as a leader in so many different ways. And I think, um, so it's going to be a fantastic, fantastic discussion today. I'm going to do a very brief overview um, as, as we've been doing uh, literally all the time, you know, um, as we've been running these sessions. So allow me just literally uh, five minutes to just do the introduction and set the scene for the topic. And then we're going to hand over into, into Q&A with Bob. Um, so if, um, just, if I can just get a thumbs up, Bob, you can see my screen okay. It's showing fantastic. Absolutely. Thank Got you. It. Thanks, Catherine. Fantastic. Okay. So um, really, the, you know that um, I'm a psychobabble girl and I love the quotes. So um, this <laughs> quote, and there's so many change quotes, really. And it's, it's not about the quote as much as about, it's about the principle. Um, it's in the times of crisis that good leaders emerge. And I think for all of us who are in, we all are in leadership positions in one form or fashion or the other, um, the, my worst leadership position is I'm an administrator of one of the WhatsApp groups and it freaks the heck out of me because I'm really bad at administrating WhatsApp groups. So that's sort of, that's, um, that's always the joke in the family. But the reality is we're all leaders in some form or fashion and, and, uh, and people look at us and how we show up and especially in times um, of crisis and goodness me, there's ever been a time that's been interesting as this. So allow me just to share four uh, key thoughts as I introduce this topic uh, in a little bit more detail. Please, we would love some of your questions in the, in the chat. So, so get them through. We're going to open for Q&A at the end. Um, but we've said this in one of the previous webinars before, and I want to reiterate this. The playing fields are level. For, for me, that is one of the most... Uh, exciting uh, parts of this whole thing. And I, I know that may sound really warped, but, but there, nobody knows and, and everybody's trying to figure it out. And as we figure it out, the, the next lockdown starts or as we figure it out, uh, um, something new um, comes about that you see the bubonic plague article two days ago on Sky. I just closed it immediately. Um, but, but, but as an example, but the reality is the playing fields are now level. And we all have this opportunity um, through this crisis to restart and rehash. And Bob's going to share some of these thoughts with us um, on, 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 on what that means and what he's seen. But I, I really believe we should be taking heart in that. That doesn't mean the playing fields are easy, but it means they are all equal and all level and we're all learning. And, um, and what we are seeing is that there's a new emergence of, um, of leaders coming through, but I'll talk about that at, in, my, in my fourth and last point. The, the second thing about almost everything that we knew um, has now changed and specifically as it relates to traditional leadership styles, traditional leadership um, methods, and even those leaders who are seen to be offbeat and creative and different, the playing fields have changed for them as well. So even those leaders that we have been uh, really looking up to have had to adjust. And everything we knew has changed around that. Distributed teams, I mean, really, the issue now of if, 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 if you were a leader with trust issues and distributed teams, now that is even a, a, a greater issue to deal with. Or if you were a leader that completely had no trust issues um, and depending on the responses of the different distributed teams, that is also an issue. So just this essence of what we knew changed and, and how we now manage that. I, for the first time we are, and that's my third point, the ultimate test of management and leadership. For the first time, those leaders um, who were not as comfortable, be too, comfortable to be transparent 
um, and just authentic. We have no choice. I mean, we literally have kids running into uh, into Sky News interviews. We, we, we literally have this work-life blend that's happened. And, uh, and I'm trying to, to, to coin that phrase. It's a work-life blend. It is no longer an eight to five, Monday to Friday. And, and how do we show up and how do we, how do we engage with that is, um, is, is real. It's, it's questions that sound so simple, but have such a dramatic impact because we have to be completely aware at the next level. And, 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 and there's some interesting ideas that Bob has around this, you know, that IQ, EQ um, into, into the next level. Um, and we'll speak about that. So, so really the ultimate test of management and leadership at the moment, leadership's being humanized. We, as leaders, we are now human beings. And um, what I like about Bob Skinstead, and I say your surname because it's, it's an important point I want to say, is that just the authenticity of leadership that's come through and, and how Bob's been, um, been showing up in this. And then lastly, this issue of, of, of new leaders emerging. And we had a very busy week. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's Friday, but we've had a very busy week. And one of the conversations, in fact, it was a it was a meeting around um, strategy with 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 uh, Bob was in the meeting. There was a very interesting discussion that happened. Won't go into the detail of the discussion. I want to talk about the essence. It was this thing of courageous conversations. I want to call it that in the age of Zoom. And Bob challenged our thinking on something. There was a conversation to be had. Uh, with a specific group of people and he challenged our thinking uh, specifically as we were not, I don't think, Bob, we were, you were actually on that screen, so I'm looking there. I don't think all on the call were completely invested in having courageous conversations and just the mere fact of a different voice coming in and challenging the issue of having courageous conversations really made me think a lot last night after that meeting. So really, we're going to talk about these four points very broadly. You'll see in the questions that we will go to um, that we will touch on these. But, but the reality is our realities have changed. As a leader, I don't think I have doubted myself as much ever um we don't always get it wrong i was a horrible leader this week it was i was a rookie in terms of calendar scheduling i was an overwhelm and um, completely sleep deprived and just angry with life in general and now to go and show up and have a leadership discussion at the end of the week is an interesting uh, an interesting one but the reality is we don't get it right all the time and no better person bob we spot on time 10.15 to, uh, to, 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 to hand over to Bob, but I, I want to close on this. Two things and then go to Bob. There's this thing that McKinsey speaks about currently. The rate, latest research says the only way leaders are coping currently because they're still figuring it all out um, is these two things of the value of deliberate calm. And I absolutely love that. Um, and, 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 and meaning the ability to detach from the crisis and think clearly and navigating it. And then the second one, this of bounded optimism, meaning no, not every business will make it. And no, not every job will make it. And the bounded optimism means there's optimism, but with a sense of reality. And if we get through that, how we get. So Bob, welcome. It's lovely, it's lovely, lovely to have you on. I, uh, just, just for everybody to first just catch up on what's happening in your world and, um, and, uh, and then we'll get into the, into the actual content. But just talk us a little bit through where are you, where, where do you live, what's up? Thanks so much, Catherine. I, I, I really appreciate it. I'll, I'll give a little two-minute overview. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to say uh, thanks for having me. I mean, you and I work closely together, so it's lovely to, to, to do this kind of thing in a professional environment a lot, and I'm very lucky to do that. But I want to thank um, Cobra in particular, Maurice and Emma, who I've, I've spoken to, and, and all the contributors. I, I really think what you're doing is important. Um, it's very needed, um, and I think it's, it's hugely appreciated and it's hugely beneficial um, you know, in the work, business, and personal environment of, of South Africa and around the world in, a, in what is a difficult time. So thank you for the opportunity to be a, a small part of that. Um, I'll give you a quick summary. I, I was obviously very lucky to play sport for a living, but I was one of the guys who sort of bridged um, 
professionalism um, and amateur rugby. I probably got into rag- rugby because I enjoyed it um, more than anything else. I never saw it as a career. So all the way through my career, I was always involved in business. I was lucky enough to build up a business and sell it in South Africa um, and joined a family friend of mine to set up a family office, um, the, the, in particular the, the, the London office. Um, and this individual had, had been fabulously successful in various businesses and was looking to, to build a, a slightly bigger team of people around him um, that, that, that could you know, manage some of the investments, etc. I had, through that uh, process of being involved in, in my own businesses, um, created a relationship with a guy called Kit from Sale, who I was at university with at Stellenbosch University and the team around him. So Andrea Bowman and, and um, uh, Eben van Heerden, um, who'd set up Knife Capital. I, I don't know if you remember the Mark Shuttleworth uh, Here Be Dragons Fund. They were the first sort of VCs in South Africa. Then they set up their own fund, which I joined. Um, and we launched a fund uh, as we launched uh, 12J initiatives in South Africa. So a few of the people who sort of know about the, the entrepreneurial and tax structured um, investments. That, that was the, the initial fund. And then I've come over to set up an office here. And the family office that, that I joined bought that business with us. Um, the family office, my role in the family office is, is we've got two main investments. Um, one is a, a very large South African origin uh, labeling business. So we make all the labels for huge international retailers. It's quite a complex process. Some of the labels um, you even have to, you know, we've, we've, we've got to cut with sound. Um, we, we do a lot of work for Victoria's Secret. So if you can imagine all the, the, the ladies around the world, if you're buying a, a, um, a set of underwear for a couple of hundred dollars, you don't want to scratch your label. And um, the expertise of that is, is something that we've bought into. Uh, we've obviously got loads of other clients around the world. Um, and then we are also a, a big shareholder in a dental aggregator. Now that sounds um, very fancy, but it's a, it's basically a roll-up. So we, we buy dental practices and then we centralize the costs. Uh, we, we help the management. We help um, the leaders in that business. Um, and we cut the costs and we make them more profitable. Um, and th- those are the two main businesses I'm involved in for the family office. Uh, and in particular, Knife Capital. So I've got a leadership role in, in Knife Capital. Um, and it keeps me busy. You know, I've, I still do a little bit of commentary. Um, I live in, in Weybridge, which is a little town um, south of London. I was commuting an hour 15 each way up until about March the 10th. Um, but our, our chairman, um, who started the family office, has, got, has had some underlying health issues for a while. He's, he had some quite bad asthma as a kid growing up. So as you can imagine, he finds himself in a, um, in a, in a particularly high-risk category um and when COVID broke out he, he's got a um a sort of a hideaway a, a farm out in cornwall um so him and the family have actually been out there since i think at the 11th of march um i've been to and from a number of times for for sort of um board meetings and and some face to face but we've we've applied all the protocols and 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 we've kept our, our um, social distancing etc um but there was just more to have some face time um, and I've been really front and center of these businesses managing their way through difficult times. So I've got a few, I've got a few interesting stories about it, um, and, and I've really enjoyed it. But I loved your quote from, from Rudy Giuliani, um, and I think I can, I can expand on that. I, I genuinely think that the, the, the best leaders, and wherever they come from, it doesn't matter to me. You can imagine I, I certainly don't, need, don't think someone needs to have 10 degrees or have fought a war to be a leader, they're, they're leaders in, in households all over the country, all over the world, um, who are managing families um, that, have, that don't have the opportunity to, to study. So, so I, I don't think it's, it's confined to one type of person, but I do think one of the characteristics is that um, the better the leader, uh, the tougher the times, the better they handle it. You, you might actually see that a lot of those leaders are um, <clears throat> slightly big picture thinkers, maybe a little bit less concentrating on, on, on detail, et cetera, probably admin um, light. Uh, and, and, and then when, when, when the crisis hits or when the difficult times hit, their clarity of thought, their ability to maintain that calmness that you spoke about and the ability to, to use a big picture thinking to, to manage their optimism, but to bound it in, in, um, in a, in a framework that is realistic, uh, certainly shines through. And, and we're seeing a lot of that in, in some of our businesses. 
Fantastic, Bob. That, uh, that's, great. that's a great overview. And um, I think such a good segue into my, my, real, my, my, my first question, really. You've, you've had this massive transition and change in your own life from the world of sport and, and all what that was about um, into the world of investment. And it's two completely different worlds, although we can argue they're the same, but for the principle of this uh, discussion, uh, uh, what, what, you know exactly what I mean. Talk us through literally uh, heart and head stuff from having to have made that transition, the change. What did that mean? Well, it's a great question because, I mean, it, 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 you know, it, it's front and center to, to any form of change. It's, you know, what does it mean to you? Why are you doing it, et cetera? I mean, I remember I had a, a rugby career which was, which was interesting to say the least. I mean, at 26, 27, I, I retired and I came overseas to the UK and I retired because my dad was a doctor um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, once I get to 30, I can't be a rugby player anymore. What, what do I do? And, and, and I haven't got day-to-day -day experience. Um, you know, how am I going to transition? Um, so I jumped out of rugby. Um, I had a, a young fiance and then wife in that, in that year that it took me to make that decision. Um, and I, I joined Saatchi and Saatchi Advertising Agency. I did an internship. I ended up working for them for three and a half years and absolutely loved it. Um, I worked between London and, and um, Europe and New York and handled um, some international brands which, which had used sport for their advertising. So then I sort of thought to myself, okay, well, that's a, a little bit of a segue into, into, um, into a business life. Um, and I got a phone call in, in London um, from a guy that I used to play with. And he said, look, you know, we, we want someone to, to come and play. I, I saw you playing a, a, a social rugby game um, a couple of weeks ago, and I had been playing for the Barbarians, um, which is an international sort of team that doesn't really play out of one country. They just pick, you know, guys who are available. And I was lucky enough to have played okay. And he said, we, we'd like you to, to come back and, and play a bit. And I thought, you know what, we do want to go back to SA. We, we love South Africa. This was 11 years ago now, 12 years ago now. And um, we, I used that, that as a sort of a soft landing. So I went back to South Africa, played some rugby for the Sharks. And, and um, it was, I had a wonderful team around me that was incredibly lucky. And, and the rest is history. I was able to be part of a Rugby World Cup team. So I was, I, you know, I, I never, ever go through a, a sort of a talk about my career without saying how lucky I was to play alongside some great people and with some great coaches, et cetera, and, and literally bounce from, from lucky bit to lucky bit. But the point of the story is not, is not um, achieving in rugby. The point of the story was I dipped my toe into the work world and I, then I wasn't afraid anymore. Then I thought to myself, you know what? If rugby stops tomorrow, I'll get a job in a pub. It, do, it actually doesn't matter and I'll work my way up. I'm, I'm now comfortable with my level of work ethic amongst my peers and I know what I need to do to survive and, and and that's what made the biggest difference for me so the easy thing is then saying well what could you take from rugby to work and you know I, I try and say this every time it's it's a little bit like being the coach of your own rugby team you know do you do you play a good player who does x and make them do y no madness do you do it in rugby no so why would you do it in business and and I had these relationships with, with people who'd been in venture capital and, and in the startup world, Kit in particular. So I would take my business ideas as, as a player. Remember, suddenly from a student, you're a 22-year-old who's got more available cash flow than your, your own parents. You know, it doesn't happen to a lot of people, but it happens to professional sportsmen. So I had to then suddenly say, okay, you know, who's going to help me with this? So I reached out to people that I thought were A players. And, and, and Kit Fonsell was a great example. He worked in banking, risk mitigation, investing, um, and then went into venture capital. So if I got a, what I thought was a good idea, I would take it to him and he would say no. And then I would go back to the drawing board because, because he's got a fantastic process. And he's known to say no quite often, right? Well, exactly. He learned from the best. He's uh, Urban from Heaven. So no is a very good answer in investing. Um, and the I would use those A players in their position to help me. And, and then that became what I did later on. I mean, I think one of the, the, the most important decisions I, I, I ever made was, was to, to try and make some of my sort of cash that was available to me. And I, and I bought into a restaurant hospitality business. But um, I, I used 
the A players, the advisory capacity of these people to say how I should do it. And it really changed how that business was ready for me to exit it later on. Because a lot of people get in, you know, you, you invest for what you think is the fun bit and the growth bit and all that kind of stuff. You don't invest for what you're going to do when this timeline runs out. And, and I, I think I was saved by that and, and saved by, by playing A players in, in my advisory um, sort of board or group of people. That's, that, that's lovely. And, and thanks, Emma, for posting that, uh, that comment. Also, it really is uh, uh, an invaluable insight, this thing of let people play their talents. And, and I think as, as, as leaders, uh, we often forget that. Um, I saw a very interesting thing last night, um, Bob, as I was preparing for this discussion um, about where they are now separating leaders in terms of saying, um, and this was one of the, I think it, I think it, was, a, it, it was a Forbes article I speak under correction, but it was saying about they are now separating leaders from in times when it really is tough. And I want to ask you, and I know this is off script, but I know you're okay with it. In times when things are really tough. So uh, I want you to actually, if you can use one of your, uh, one of your games examples, um, where traditional roles of how the players need to play and they know what they need to do and something dramatically happened. Um, what then? Uh, because this, this Forbes article says we're now seeing a very clear delineation going between leaders who now do things and leaders, what you've alluded to, who will just have to lead things. Um, and sometimes the leaders who, le who, who did things now leading, uh, they missed on the doing. What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know what, Catherine, it, it, it's such a good point. Um, and, and, and I'll depart a little bit because I, I want to give you an example, but it's actually not a rugby example. It's a, it's a real life example. So let's go back to those businesses that I was talking about. Um, we've already had one comment here and, and, and well picked up. You know, if, if, you, if you understand what I, what I mentioned, those businesses are in people facing supply. So, so um, the, the, the label making business um, the revenues of that label making business took an 87% hit from the end of February to the middle of March, you know, and, and the, the best leadership I saw was from our chairman. Remember I said, so he had some, some, I think they call it comorbidity type um, uh, afflictions and, 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 you know, in particular asthma um, growing up. So anything to do with the lungs and that, and, and he actually said, look, I just want to get out of here. But you know what? He led every single day. He phoned every leader of those businesses, every region. I'm talking 18 factories around the world. So individuals in sales, marketing, business development, leadership. So we manufacture and sell. It's quite an interesting business because you need to, you need to be accredited by the brand. So let's just say we went out and we were selling, what's a brand I'd like to win? Um, I like outdoor brands. So, so Patagonia. Patagonia this labels business makes, it not only makes the care label in the back, but it also makes things like uh, the dye sublimate, you know, the, if, if there's a, an image on your shirt or, or, or if, you, if you've got the little Patagonia sign here or, or the cap and the label and the tag. So, so you know, there, there are lots of things you make, but if the demand dries up, you know, you've still got to run factories, you've still got thousands of people relying on you to, to come to work in, in, in all different areas and jurisdictions. Um, and then you've got people saying, well, what do we do? Do we make? Are we going to sell again? We, we know that it's up to the retailer whether they're selling enough on online versus, versus offline or, or high street. But we've still got to understand the supply to get to them. So the first thing he did, he said, let's preserve cash. So let, wherever we've got outstanding um, payments from, from our own suppliers, let's call on those now preserve cash, make sure that we can create a runway and manage our people going forward. Cash flow is absolutely king in a, in a, in a, a critical time like this. He was onto that straight away because he's a mathematician and a, and a, um, a sort of very numbers oriented person. He understood that the, the, the runway was shortening much quicker than any of us did. He, he knew, you know, because, because a lot of businesses, um, are, you know, they're, re they're reliant on the buffer between the revenue and they've got some outstandings and, you know, they, everybody plays hope. And I want to talk one thing about this crisis that has been positive. But anyway, that leadership that he showed to just on a daily basis, we went from monthly catch-up calls to daily update calls. So now Monday, Tuesday, 
Thursday, Friday, we have a daily update call. Wednesday, we have a state of the nation. And state of the nation is things that would need more approval. So, so, so CapEx above a certain amount. I mean, it, it's a big business. I'm not going to lie. It's a, it's a, a business which you could, you could probably value in the, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So, so it, it, it really is um, important to, to stay on top of that. But also, um, if, if you manage the little bits, the little bits add up to the big bits. So, so that leadership, I thought, was fantastic. And you know what? We're, we're three and a half months in. We haven't missed a daily meeting. And, and I know that's difficult, but it's an hour. It's a 45-minute it's a to an hour catch-up with Hong Kong. Um, or, so, so Canada wakes up and Hong Kong's going to bed, but all those people are on, are on the same call with us in the middle. And, and it, it really is a, a, a super example of how to manage people, how to, to um, manage their expectations, how to understand everybody's position on things. And, and everybody's jumped in. So some people and staff were furloughed. Some people have been asked to take deferment of salary, but the chairman's talking to you on a daily basis. It's not like no one turns up and that they're sort of putting out this, this um, image of swanning it on holiday while you're doing the hard work. They're there in the trenches with you. And, and that's made the biggest difference. Okay, so yeah. park that business. And then the leader in the dental business. Now, you think that the, the retail business took a, a hit in, in revenues. The dental business went from 108% of budget Okay, so tracking 8% ahead. So you can imagine everybody swanning around and shooting the lights out to 4% of budget in one week. Now, the reason that, that that happened is that the British Dental Association closed every dental practice. So, so our model is that we make a certain amount of money based on what the dentists make. And the fuller they are, the more money they make. We, we help them with the costs and the marketing, etc. but they've still got to make the money themselves. So... Now, we then, within 10 days, had, had rebudgeted the entire business for the next two years, okay? We are now 60 to 70% ahead of what we call the negative budget because we said, let's go and let's say we don't get opened. Let's say we don't, because remember, we don't know. I mean, last night, I woke up this morning to the lovely news that 61,000 people in America have, have contracted the coronavirus in the last day. You know, now we're in 60,000 a day. I'm not sure that we're not going to have a, a second peak. I think, I think we probably are. And that's going to affect these businesses and, and how we work, et cetera. But anyway, two, the two examples of leadership were jump in at the toughest time and lead with the people. Now, I'm not saying that my chairman jumped in and taught people how to make better labels or do anything, but he said, here is the forum. We can talk. Let's, let's, let's work together through the problems that are affecting you on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know what? We've now gone from high crisis, um, high volume meetings to much lower crisis, low volume meetings. And, and the importance of, of how we did that could then reflect across in the dental business. And they did exactly the same thing. They said, okay, we're going to get nothing for the next six months. How do we do this? What, you know, what are we going to do to preserve cash? How are we going to help the dentists? And I've been shown some incredible leadership by a young guy, a young South African dentist, actually, um, Eben van der Walt is his name. I uh, studied at Stellenbosch a little bit behind me. But he's, I'd say he's probably one of the younger dentists in the group, but he's just stood up as a shining example of a leader. So I went to his practice to go and get, in a pre-board pre meeting, to go and get a real sense of like, how closed are you? You know, because you need to know what, 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 what's real and what's not. And, and I broke protocols and did all that stuff. But, you know, we, I went with all the masks and all that kind of stuff. And I went and said, okay, what can you do? So he's opened up new rooms. And now he moves from room to room while they clean the, the fellow time room. So he's managed to get all of his dentists up and operating. He's back to almost 100% of operational facility, but in a different way. So the cost structure is a, a little bit bigger, but, but the revenues are there. The way that he's spoken to people, the way that he's led people, do you know what he did? He's, he sat in his, in his, um, uh, his uh, what you, you would say the waiting room, I suppose, of, of the, what would be a, a dentist practice or, or a doctor's practice. And he said, I have a daily call with my staff about what they're going to do when they get back. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, if you're going to put on a play, you don't not rehearse. 
And I, you know, I was just blown away. He said, I talk him through and I say, when you come in now, now that you can't just stand around and infect people and do all those kind of things, you're going to stay in your car until 7.59 at 8.00. The first person will come in at 8.01. The next person will come in. And then by 8.07, all seven of the hygienists will be in and the assistants and the nurses. And then by 8.09. And you know what? They do it every single day. And they're up there operating because the demand hasn't dropped off. It's a little bit like the other business. People still want to buy stuff. Now we're just buying them online. We're still going to make it, but now you're going to get into a factory and make sure. So I've been absolutely blown away by the quality of leader and their ability to change in, in, in difficult times. And, and you mentioned at the very beginning, you said, you know, is this a, an, an IQ, EQ mix? I, I also read an article which I was blown away by, and it's, it's called, or it, it, it talks about the, the rise of, of AQ. And that's your adaptability quotient. And, and I think that, that when we were talking about sport, I've seen people who've come out of professional sport backgrounds or, or let's just say different backgrounds to what they currently do and the adaptability to be able to morph your job, your role. Nobody asked Evan van der Waals to turn into a person who rehearses a, a, a role for, for other people around him. He, he's, a, he's a highly qualified, outstanding clinical dentist but he showed leadership in a completely di different adaptive role, which I think is brilliant to see. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and Bob, I, I love that. I think I just, I, I want to do a little bit more work on the IQ plus EQ equals, yeah, equals AQ, if you don't mind. So I, just to wrap on that question. So what I've heard you really say is really um, jumping, in, jumping, lead from the front, um, and it really sounds the example you used with your chairman was that of, you know what, um, very clearly leading and making sure that the experts still get to do what they can do in the time. And then what I really, really loved uh, about the dentist example that you've just used is this thing of, of rehearsing. And I think, um, I think you touch such a good point. For me, what, what's become, becoming very apparent is in the past uh, pre-Zoom days, I don't even want to call it pre-COVID days, um, <laughs> we could pitch sometimes a little bit unprepared and just swing it. And I've almost find that this rehearsing thing has become much more uh, to the fore uh, because we, we have such intense time on Zooms like this all the time, that if you show up unprepared, it's almost like you put the conversation back. You're not, um, you're not respecting those who come on and you're not, you, 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 you appear not to be rehearsed and you appear not to know uh, what you, so those are two beautiful points that, that you've raised that in fact, I think um, that's, that's my Twitter quote for the day. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are absolutely, absolutely br brilliant. Thank you for those. So let me let me just ask you a little bit more about this um, this article that you alluded to with um, this adaptability quotation. Uh, oh, oh, quirk, I can never say the word. Help me with it. Quotient. Um, quotient. Exactly. Um, Afrikaans school from the little town of Utenhaek struggles with that word sometimes. <laughs> okay. I don't so, believe that so, for a second. Yeah. So so. They speak about it's the balance of IQ and EQ, or that plus that. Uh, and, and I want you to talk about that, but leading in with this thought, those who used to be showing up as rock stars may still do, and our expectation are that they still do. But the reality is that the tools in our toolbox that used to get us there in the old ways are not. So it, we may have focused on IQ dramatically or, uh, the, 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 or just the EQ, but head or heart stuff. And now it's this let's adapt together. Share more thoughts around that. And if, you, if, if, if I can ask for maybe another example out of that, um, um, of what you've experienced, where, where you've seen it work or not. Yeah, sure. That, I mean, and, and, and you're right. I mean, you, you need to expand on these things. It's easy just to, to, to throw away a thought. But for me, okay, I, I mentioned that, that my role covers um, the family office and there's three different businesses. We've gone through the labeling business and the dental business. So, so the other business, which is probably the closest to my heart and, and, and I enjoy the most is, is in venture capital um, and it's at, at Knife Capital. Now, so Knife Capital manages a fund um, in South Africa, in the 12J space, we 
<clears throat> we handhold entrepreneurs um, through a sort of a courting stage where we, we get to know them, we, we get interested in their business, and then we've got available money and, and sometimes we invest. Um, and when we invest, they become part of our portfolio. Currently in our, in our fund in South Africa, there are seven businesses. Um, and if I was to use an example of where AQ has, has, has become incredibly clear, it's in the different reactions of the leaders in those different businesses in different times, in, in, in difficult and different times. So we, we, used, the, we used the term accelerant um, earlier. So, so COVID for me has been an accelerant. Now think of the nature of an accelerant. An accelerant can be incredibly good or an accelerant can be incredibly bad. Any, any, any bad golfer like myself will tell you if you hit a golf ball um, in wind, whatever you do badly, the wind makes it much worse. So if it's going the wrong way, it keeps going, you know, further and further. Um, and for example, with a fire, uh, throwing petrol on a fire is a, it's a good accelerant to, to get more heat. It's not great if you've already got your chops and your sausages on the bra because it's going to absolutely blitz it. So that accelerant, think of it in terms of what COVID has done. COVID is, has, has affected all of us by making the people who didn't like technology need technology. I mean, my mum, bless her soul, admin, not her, her best um, uh, feature, but now she's on FaceTime, WhatsApp call, uh, all the different options to get hold of her grandkids because she's, she doesn't have one of us phoning her um, because, you know, we, life has happened and we've got so much. Obviously, we take the calls every day, but now she knows how to handle the technology around it. Um, that's a good accelerant in terms of she's now able to pick and choose what she wants to do and interact with us. That's great. The bad accelerant side of it is what I said with some of our other businesses is that if there was a crack um, in your business, if there was a bad um, part of your business, the, the pressure from COVID has accelerated how much that affects your business. So these little VC businesses, and they range from um, – uh, auto, the AI for autonomous manufacture on the one side, a lovely business called Data Profit, all the way to a ticketing business called Quicketing. And we've got some education businesses in between. We've got a, a soda startup. We've got, we've got some, some businesses in, in, in remote monitoring um, for, for fridges, etc. cetera. It, it, it's a lovely um, sort of diverse bunch of businesses. But all of the CEOs have shown that we made a good decision to back them as people and leaders because they've been able to use this time to lead. You know, one of the leaders has had to change what he does. In fact, he's had to redevelop some of the software and he's had to really work hard to, um, I mean, you know, if, if you think I had a sub story about revenue going off a cliff, imagine when you're a ticketing business that relies on events happening and every event in the country just got canceled, you know? So, um, but, but that CEO turned around and put, within a month and a half, put 17,500 people in a room with Mark Lottering for the biggest paid gig that Mark Lottering has ever done in, the his, in his history of comedy. And Amazing. Kurt Schoenrod, exactly the same thing. Now, now, they had to redevelop and then redeploy a platform where that was possible. They had to, to, to upskill and teach customers to, to, to use a pay link that they invented to, to pay for something they'd never paid for before. You know, you don't, you, you, when you turn on your TV, you've already paid your Mnet or your Sky TV or whatever it is, and you see a, a comedian on TV, you don't feel like paying extra. Now the comedian's on your computer, you've got to go through a whole host of new things, like we said, accelerant to difficult things, and they manage that incredibly well. So, so we are so proud of them. Obviously, revenues aren't where they were because live events are not there, but I now know that that leader whatever next business because he's going to exit this business and will exit it very profitably when things are right and when he invests in the next thing i want to be alongside him you yeah, know what i mean wow. i know I, I i know that that he's displayed the aq that we were talking about he's very smart so he's got the iq that's fine he manages a team very well he's empathetic so he's got the eq we know that he's emotionally sound but he's demonstrated the aq that shows leadership in in a difficult time and and we've got Another example is, is one of the CEOs has had to literally hold his hat 
you know, and, and just jump on because the train was going so fast because he was in an online learning platform. Yeah. yeah. So, so that his accelerant there was like, oh, oh, we don't have the resources to grow this quickly. So he's had to show, and he's shown very, very, um, you know, organized and manageable, um, sustained management of that growth in a time when he needed to be calm and, 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 and go forward in, in that sort of um, the, d- displaying the AQ that we spoke about. You know, you, you could suddenly say, oh, you know, there's new revenue. You just grab absolutely everything and then fall apart because people don't want to be, um, you know, abused in a difficult time. So, so actually that business started giving away some of the educational tools, created a, a better path to upgrade. So, you know, the, the, the um, Snapify is the business and Wesley Lynch is the, is the CEO, but used the, the opportunity of, of things like what have been highlighted by Cobra to talk about how important education was and online education. And that's the nub of his business. That's the core of his business. He, he makes available online versions of, you know, published works. And, and it, it's just been a great story to see how he's, he's managed that as well. So it's a number of different examples, but I think Knife Capital and the, and the way that Kit and Andrea had, again, daily updates, they made cash available yeah. for the businesses. They said, look, we invested in you pre-crisis. So there are going to be crappy times. <laughs> and this is in particular one of those times. So we have gone to the board and we've made available cash. You tell us what you need it for. And we created a mechanism where we said, okay, we will pre-lend you, you know, money to, to manage the business, but then let's do it together and let's do it with milestones and let's make sure you come out the other side. So it's been incredible um, to see the combination of the different styles of leadership. Thank you for those, uh, those examples, Bob. They, they're real. And I think the, the, the one thing that you said about um, the indicator that it will be for future crises and how those leaders will show up is so important. And, and it's that question that I always ask myself uh, and I share, I've shared it on all the webinars so far with Cobra, but it's that question where, when we look back three years later and we look back and somebody asks me, where were you during that time and how did you show up? I would really want to hand on heart say that show that properly. So I just want to, whilst we're there, because Renee has, has asked a question there, just to close up on the accelerant um, comment you made. Do you think that accelerant would lead to a different sifting of our leaders during and post COVID? It's a great question. I mean, I, I, I'm always hesitant to, to be judging leaders and to get too political about that kind of thing. But I, but I, I definitely believe that you, you see the good and you also see the bad of leaders. You know, people who are happy just to um, say something, um, in particular from a leadership point of view, I think the example here in the UK was, was um, uh, Boris Johnson said, you know, we will make all parking free at hospitals. And, and it was part of about 60 things that he said in a speech, which was actually just there to rally the support that he thought he needed to pass a bill about you know, using, using public funds to, to, um, to prop up the economy. Now, let's call the accelerant is now a greater focus on what they said and what they have did of what they've said. Everyone's going, where's the free parking? You know, where's the free parking, Boris? And no, I'm not listening to another speech until my nurses and doctors and me can park for free. I need to go to the hospital. And, you know, for me, that is an accelerant because that's now people are saying, okay, well, I tell you what, I'm not paying tax until I get free parking. Um, you know, and, and I think we will be put under an, in, an increasing spotlight as, as leaders. I think we're going to see it in South Africa. We, we, we already seeing not that as much has been done about it as, as we would like, but, but people are being called out. People are being exposed in areas of graft and, and corruption. And, and I think they're under a, a bigger and, and more heated spotlight and that's happened quickly. That's the accelerant of people now having time to sit around their computer, read the news and get angry about things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's, that's absolutely great. So, so Renee, I think uh, definitely what, uh, what Bob's saying is how we're going to be showing up and, and just even those basic decisions have much larger impact because the reality is 
we are all different right now and our, our hierarchy of needs has dropped right down into level one and two from where it was. So, so we are thinking differently um, uh, because of all of this. So, so Bob, I want to, I want to, um, we're going to uh, ask the last question and, and then I want to talk about team talk. Uh, and for those who are listening in, so we'll tell you about the team talk thing in a minute, but that's another example of where Bob is just, um, it's also a case of uh, showing up as a trusting leader, I think. Um, Bob and I have a meeting earlier this week. We speak about things and um, uh, he, he tells me a program that we have to get done and uh, just work, you know, as usual. And um, he's uh, so I say to him, well, we, you, are you okay that we give the Cobra audience a sneak peek of it <laughs> before we really, really launch? He hasn't even seen the video and he says, yeah, okay. So that is fantastic for in terms of trust. And Bob, it's because I, tr I trust you, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, goodness, yes. And, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, on a Friday after a little sleep. But thank you very much. So, Bob, lastly, um, so in, in wrapping up on this, so we, we, we've really, what, what I've heard you say is so real. You've got a show up um, th th there is that sense of reality but jumping in and leading from the front uh, regular check-ins um, use this time now to lead is another thing that you mentioned uh, coming back to the dentist's quote of uh, there's a lot of rehearsing required because it is different and we don't know exactly how things will happen and um, so and not being afraid uh, I think that was also a key message you want to wrap up in terms of all the businesses on the call right now, they've dialed in for a reason. They, they're either concerned about future revenue or they're in overwhelmed, perhaps like a snappy fine, if they're in the right industry. What advice or just some thoughts can you share with us in closing here on, uh, on just getting through this as leaders in our own way? Sure. I think, I think I'll, I'll make one, one point. I think, um, in particular in businesses and, and, and look, a lot of people are good at it. So I'm not going to, I'm not pretending at all that, that this is, this is new to everybody. Um, it's the concept of over communication. People need it. We are, we are behind walls. We, we're not interacting. We're not bumping in, into each other at the proverbial water cooler, having the meeting, checking in you're okay. Now, now leaders with a group of staff members who haven't spoken to them, you know, the easy thing, is to withdraw. The easy thing is to say, oh, you know, we'll, we'll get to the staff reviews at a later stage. But now you've got someone who's sitting there going, can I afford the house that I've dreamed about for five years and I was going to use my increase to do the, the changes or, or to make the purchase? They have got a, a, a world to themselves that's different to yours. And if you don't over communicate, that will be your accelerant. Those people will have the doubt that will make them then look for another job or change something or not contribute to the business that you're talking about or, or, or doubt themselves and not be able to do the, the, the role that you need them so badly for in the business. And, and I, I, I genuinely believe one of the things that's come through here is that the best leaders have over communicated. It's, hey guys, we're back here today and you know what? It's been difficult and it's been crap and I've got the same as you, but let's try and manage a little bit and go forward for tomorrow. Not let's talk about this next week because people, it, it's, like, it's like leaving four kids alone in a in our house you come back and everyone goes oh my god what did you why did you make such a mess it's like well you didn't tell us what to do so we just did with what was around us yeah. what we could and the, you know of course there's in, I, I say that example because i've got four kids and that happens all the time um but the best the best way to to think about it is that if the people have got what's in your head and your heart they can deal with it in their way there, there, there's much less doubt there's much less factual inaccuracy there's there's much less nerves you know so 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 we've got these lovely tools talk talk to the people you know even if the leader is empathetic and just says listen guys to be honest i don't know what's happening in the next two months but if you can trust me that i will tell you as soon as i know you then you then you've got a message that makes a difference and 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 i think that i've looked at these these various leaders in in, in these businesses and i've been just so impressed to to be part of something where they feel that that's important to do on a day-to-day -day basis and i think it's really given everybody a lot of comfort yeah absolutely love that let's take heart for all those on the call and um i hope that's been of um, a lot of value to you really 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 over communicate and um, i'm glad bob's shared exactly that point because one one sometimes thinks you are communicating 
too much, um, but that that's such great advice. So let's keep uh, keep at it. Let's keep um, just keep going. We, we have we really truly have no other choice but to, and it's actually very exciting uh, because we are we are just in a world where where there's actually so much opportunity coming about. So, in conclusion, um, Bob is launching. Bob, do you want to say it, or do we just play the video, or but well, Bob's. I, I, um, I'm happy to say two minutes. So, so Catherine has, has, has helped me do something which, which I, th I think will be fun. To be honest, living in the UK, I, every morning I jump on a train um, and I take a train into central London to, to where our family office has been based. But our chairman, I used that example, he's gone out to a hidey hole in, in, in Cornwall and literally the office is probably going to be used almost never, you know, over the next 18 months or so because of just growing uncertainty. So I've clawed back almost three hours of a, of a, of a, of a commute, two and a half to three hours. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm so lucky to be connected to various business people, people with um, a good um, outlook on life, etc. So I picked up the phone and I phoned a couple of people and they all said that they'd be more than happy to tell me some of the business stories, what they've been up to, either post-sport if it's people I've been in business with, all the leaders of these these businesses, etc., and I'm gonna I'm gonna try a little series of, of interviews slash musings um, and and do a, a podcast based on that. I, I had the misfortune of telling Catherine a little thread of that idea, and she's turned it into <laughs> she's turned it into a, something real, literally overnight. So so don't judge me. We we don't even know exactly what the name is, etc. But for example, you guys would have seen in the media the other day, Brian Habana and ex Springbok. Has, has invested in a business called Pay Me Now, which is a, a, a very highly decorated South African startup. So I texted him, I said, would you give us a run through of what that business does and, and you know, tell more people either how to get involved, how to affect them, et cetera. He said, Skinner's absolutely, but call me anytime. So next week we're phoning Brian, we're gonna have a walk around his office, he's gonna tell us what, what we're doing and, and we're gonna cover it in a series of, of sort of podcasts slash webinars called, called Team Talk. So, so thank you to, to Catherine, and also thank you to everybody at, at Cobra who's attended this. Please reach out to anyone who can make contact with me. I'm very easy to get hold of, um, and I've really enjoyed being part of this today. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Bob. So um, we'll, we'll play out with, um, with Bob's uh, two, uh, two, it's, it's a two minute video. Um, Bob, you and I are seeing it literally for the first time actually together. So, <laughs> but it's a pre-launch. We wanted to do I, I can't COVID. be nervous because if it's wrong, we change it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, um, and, and truly it's, uh, it's just to say thank you to Cobra um, uh, as part of what the great work that you are doing. So uh, you actually just seeing the sneak peek. So I've shared my screen. Just give me a thumbs up. You can see my screen. Yeah. It's a bit, everybody get cool, cool. Fantastic. So, and I think the sound is on. So here we go. Hi guys, this is a little promo for uh, what's going to be uh, Bob Skinstad's Team Talks or just Team Talks. To be honest, I'm not that hung up on the name right now because uh, we've been through a hundred different versions of that and that's not what's important. What's important is we're going to be interviewing and looking at entrepreneurial stories, some out of South Africa, some from international and some bridging both those, uh, those environments. I'm lucky enough to work with people in that space in South Africa, Knife Capital, Grindstone, Think Room Consulting and a number of other uh, people in let's call it the, the VC universe um, and we see entrepreneurs on a daily basis we see the struggles they go through we see the highs and lows of what happens in their lives and we understand some of the journey so we're not going to tell you about companies that are going to do something we're going to tell you about companies that have done something I've also got access to some sportsmen uh, men and women in uh, my network who've launched little businesses on the side some of them doing very well some of them doing very badly we're gonna we're gonna pick apart those journeys and see how much we can learn from the people in the universe around us. It's entrepreneurs, it's fun, it's gonna be lighthearted, but it'll be so much more fun if you share it with the people in your network and we can get the audiences up and share the stories.
Fantastic. And that's the end. Please get hold of Bob. We, we really need you. We need your stories. <laughs> and Bob, that's been the best bit of leadership I've seen with somebody trusting me completely without even seeing a piece <laughs> of the footage. So thank you thank very you. much. Thanks for that work, eh? Yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> we're very, 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 very spoiled to have you guys on today. We, we're, we're indebted to you. If you want to get hold of Bob or Catherine, you can email info at cobra.org.za. Uh, you can reach out that way. Go to the website, www.cobra.org.za, and uh, you'll have further details there. There is a portal that you can uh, utilize there. So once again, thanks uh, to Bob, thanks to Catherine, and thanks to the panelists. Uh, we have another webinar uh, on Monday, so please join us uh, for some further insights there. Thanks again. Importantly, thanks to the attendees for joining. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for having me. Cheerio.